Um. <clears throat> What's up? It's me, your favorite shit hey. internet roommate. And I'm getting the idea that y'all love to hear me talk about atmosphere. That's right, I'm acting up. I am once again obsessing over little nerdy details of games and conflating them to be more important than they actually are. But this time I'm talking atmosphere in the Zelda games. Zelda for a lot of gamers, both old and new, holds a lot of firsts. Your first dungeon, or your first boss fight, or maybe even your first crush. Point is that Zelda, hey, 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 and that goes for me as well. The first time I would see something in a game that made me shit bricks, and then right after that, pick up those shit bricks and get the fuck out of there. The first time I would hear a little tune and realize that this is going to stay in the deep crevices of my brain for the rest of my living life. Once just being a cheerful, joyful sound to then slowly becoming one of the numerous reminders that each day as my body decays, I grow closer to my inevitable demise, and this tune will only provide a momentary nostalgic bliss. But who the f*** cares when it's a bop of this magnitude? Are you hearing this? And it's the first time that I would experience the power of atmosphere. When I think back about the very first times that I felt I wasn't just playing a game, that I was actually in the game, you know? <laughs> I think of the first time that I entered the Temple of Time. I wasn't forced to do a cinematic slow walk. No, no, no. I chose to do that. I chose to walk ever so slowly and, should I say, heroically, <laughs> because I felt like this place was sacred. It was ancient. It would be wrong to run through these floors. And that is atmosphere, baby. So today I want to talk about some of my favorite atmospheric moments in Zelda. But if you've seen my Souls atmosphere video, in that one I hit all the main Souls games. I won't be doing that here, mainly because um, there's, there's a lot of Zelda games. <laughs> But luckily, that's what you're here for, and that's what the comment section's for, as I know that I'm most likely not going to talk about some atmosphere games that uh, I'm sure people love. So please leave a comment about your favorite atmospheric moment. I want to hear all about your love for the vibes and uh, Link's crossbow training. <laughs> Zelda in general is a very atmospheric series. You can feel it in even the littlest of things. From the wacky side characters to even the little sound effects that play when you open a chest. I have played well over a hundred hours of Tears of the Kingdom, but I still watch this cooking animation every single time. Because even this little animation has such a vibe to it, like him gathering all these ingredients, throwing them into a pot, and just watching them cook and sizzle. Oh, man. Like, I wish Link could just come to my house and cook a meal for me just like this. And uh, while I can't get that exactly, I can get something like it with our sponsor! Woo! I am killing it with these transitions. <laughs> Y'all should just use my link now, just, just, just off the fact of how great my transitioning is. Come on. That's right, folks. We are sponsored by America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh. And honestly, being an adult, I feel like one of the most demoralizing parts of my days are just trying to figure out how to have enough time for everything. I'm already too busy trying to make time for work and uh, some free time and time with friends that it's hard to even think about all the things you need to do to make a meal. <laughs> I gotta research to find what are good healthy ingredients, then I gotta go to the store, get those ingredients, come back home, cook those ingredients, and then after eating all that, I need to clean all- it's- 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 it's too much! Which is why I think HelloFresh for someone who struggles with these kind of things would be a great asset, as they will deliver those nutritious ingredients and those chef-crafted recipes right to your door for a price you'll like, which saves so much time in your day. <laughs> and it's a new year, so I know, much like me, you too want to be that baddie, walking up to that next year, leaving behind last year's baggage. <laughs> so if a goal you have this year is eating healthier, HelloFresh can greatly provide that with their calorie smart and protein smart recipes. But on top of all of that, if you do use my code, POGPITSTOPFREE, <laughs> I love that they went with that one, <laughs> you get the special perk of as long as you keep this subscription active, you get free breakfast for life. Now, I don't know about you, but having a free breakfast with my subscription for the rest of my life, that's really going to help those mornings where I just, you know, kind of like sit on the bed and just kind of...
Instead, I'm gonna be joyfully running to my door to collect my free breakfast for life. Whether your New Year's resolution is to save money, eat better, or just stress less, HelloFresh can help with all three. And if that sounds like something you need on your baddie walking up to next year journey, click the link in the description or use my code and get free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. Thank you, HelloFresh. And back to the video. But for me, I think I want to start at where uh, Zelda first introduced Atmosphere Tomb. <music> Ocarina of Time is the very first time that I ever in a game felt atmosphere. It's a story as old as time. My big brother was playing a cool looking game and I was just like, hey, could I play too? He then lightly scruffs my hair as he continues to chuckle on. <laughs> he then lifts me by my skull, holding me in the air. Gah! I shout as his laugh only gets more demonic by the second. <laughs> he then follows that up with a... I then fall to my knees. I'm hurt. I, I'm weak. I'm powerless. As I then witness his awesome power, I, I, I begin to cry. I'll, I'll never be this powerful. Never! And then, using his size 34 Black Air Forces, he stomps my face to the ground. You wanna play this game? <laughs> you ain't about that life, little bro. You can't handle this shit. Oh, Nichan, please! Gah! But that didn't stop your shonen protagonist. That night, I secretly went out there, I booted up the game, went to his save file, and was met with this. And I turned off the game. Because I indeed couldn't handle that shit. The surreal, haunting music, the warpy, trippy hallways, the atmosphere of the forest temple enraptured me, and me being on my, you know, gaga goo goo shit, I got way too spooked and couldn't continue playing. And I absolutely love that about Zelda games, that despite them mostly being, you know, rated E, they're not afraid to show the younger audience's horror and fear and more mature vibes. To a point where you're like, I don't even know, sh should this be rated E? Cause like, but it makes for a real unique type of dark atmosphere. I don't know if there's like a name for this, but it's the type of vibe that takes something that should be childlike and more wondrous and comforting and whatnot, and then contorts that into something dark and horrifying. Coraline type beat, uh, Ghibli films do this too. But it doesn't treat kids like they're kids who can't handle a little horror, a little more maturity in their media. And that vibe, that atmosphere, is felt a lot through Ocarina of Time, as it deals with a lot of themes of growing up and maturity. You even feel that in the contrasting atmospheres of the dungeons. As Kid Link, the first couple dungeons you explore are far more child, almost fairy tale like Exploring the spooky depths of the inside of a grand elder tree. A secret cavern that is made from dinosaurs' bones. You even explored the inside of a whale. Like, this is as child storybook adventure as it gets. Like, shit is wondrous out here, you know what I'm saying? Like, just take in the atmosphere of Kokiri Forest. It's this Neverland-esque little forest haven. It's all bathed in this Nintendo 64 green color that I love. You can constantly hear the sound of the nearby running waterfall. There's fairies and fireflies constantly dancing around the place. The vibes here are so whimsical, so endearing, and the music is the embodiment of childlike wholesomeness and pure joy. Like, like listen to this shit, man. And all of that only feels more powerful 
when you see it change as you pull the Master Sword, as it's time for both Link and you to grow up. Much like how when we get older, the darker aspects of reality and life begin to surface, it's when Link pulls the Master Sword that the more obvious, darker atmospheres of the game come about. The adult dungeon's atmospheres are far more serious and dark. Whether we're talking the Fire Temple, where you hear more of the temple than I really think you hear the music. The most prominent sounds there are these deep, bellowing groans and very faint drumming. Or the Water Temple, which has this bizarre, spiritual vibe. Complemented beautifully by those weird flute sounds and the just haunting dark piano notes that happen sporadically. Or again, the forest temple that made me ship bricks. And you feel that atmosphere almost immediately as soon as you exit the Temple of Time. This is one of the most memorable gaming moments ever for me. Seeing the once bright and cheerful castle town full of uh, people, happy dogs running around, a, a romantic dancing couple just enjoying life together, become a dark, grim graveyard. The skybox has become this wicked, darker color, and the town itself is in ruins. And the only thing left roaming the streets are Redeads. One of my favorite little elements that adds so much to the atmosphere of this place, in the child castle town you hear a constant of a crowd of voices. But in the adult one it is so silent that you can even hear the wind. And the only other sound you hear is the groaning of those redeads. And because you roamed this land when the stakes didn't feel as high, when it felt more like a joyous adventure, seeing that darken and feel more serious, it hits that much harder. What once was a Neverland-esque nostalgic forest, the music has faded and the area has now been taken over by monsters. The grand mountain you once scaled is now constantly erupting. The beautiful water of Lake Hylia is drained. And while there's a lot of different types of great atmosphere all over Ocarina of Time, we could talk about the comfortable dwellings of Lon Lon Ranch, where you're constantly hearing farm noises like the running of horses or neighing, while your ears are also being serenaded by Malin's beautiful singing. Or we could talk about more one-of-a-kind type of atmospheres like that in between room in the water temple? Some of the most dreamlike vibes are here. It feels like this endless void and the only thing there is the flooded lake floor, the Japanese inspired building at the end, a few stray structures, and this tree in the middle, and the very reflection of all those things. It's a whole ass liminal space. I need a 20 minute video of any Austin just talking about how great this place is. But where I feel the atmosphere of Ocarina of Time hits the hardest is in its darkest place. I could make a whole video about the vibes of uh, the bottom of the well and of course the Shadow Temple. Aesthetically, it's got so much going for the vibes. You'll find blood on the walls, you'll find wall patterns that seem to be just cluttered skeletons. You'll find others' skeletal remains. Chains that very likely once held prisoners. Rated E for everyone. This fucking thing again! spinning scythe contraptions, inanimate hands that come down and grab you and take you to the beginning of the dungeon. Fuck those things. A cool ass ghost ship? Good hunter, you've done
begun well. The night is near its end. A very clear torture device, like there's literal blood near it. Rated E for every- But also musically, the atmosphere here is just supreme. The theme here is both haunting and very spiritually toned. It sounds like the ghostly chanting of the prisoners who were tortured here. I love the pairing of hearing this deep bellowing sound. And then this more ethereal sound. It's just a perfect mixture of noise. But what really seals the deal and makes this place the most atmospheric area in the whole game is through the lore and how it all fits thematically. There's a lot of secrets to be found in the Shadow Temple. Most specifically, I'm talking about this ancient writing that states, here lies Hyrule's bloody history of greed and hatred. You know, as a kid on your Gaga Goo Goo shit, that is just, that's just scary, you know? But as an adult with a masters and doctrine in Zelda lore, that paints your perception of this entire place, which adds just this whole new vibe to the atmosphere. Because you realize the most evil place in the game wasn't created by, you know, the villain that you're actively trying to defeat. It was created by the people and the kingdom that you're actively fighting for. Ooh, that is some chillin' shit. Uh, but the thing is, the child parts of the game, while yes, have a more cheerful, joyful, adventurous atmosphere, and the adult world is a bit more bleak and uh, serious, that isn't mutually exclusive. And it's not there as like a nihilistic, oh, growing up sucks. No, parts of that dark atmosphere were already there even in the child parts of the game. Like sure, you had a wondrous exploration of this grand elder tree, but right after he succumbs to the curse left on him by Ganon and he dies. I don't think it's an accident that one of the few times that you actually have to go back to child form is to go to the bottom of the well. Not only to realize that, hey, that darkness was always there. It was just under the surface. You just couldn't see it yet. Much like how when we're kids and we don't really understand the darker aspects of the world just yet, but they become more apparent as you age. I think Ocarina shows us these contrasting atmospheres and frames them in a child versus adult type of thing so that we feel that much more of a link to our character. As now, because we've seen and felt these more beautiful, wistful atmospheres, so when we grow up and see the darker parts of the world, it motivates us to want to protect that beauty that we once knew. And thus, with courage, step into the role of the hero of time. Holy shit, the power of atmosphere. <laughs> I could end the video right there, but I got like four other games to talk about, so. Now, if you saw my atmosphere and souls video, I actually got a few souls content creators or people who make souls videos to come on and talk about their favorite atmospheric moment. And I'm also doing that here. And I'd like to welcome you to our very first guest. Allow me to play his tune real quick. Oh, hey, it's me, Rasputin. Let's talk about Zelda. There are a few title screens that establish a game's tone and atmosphere as well as the one from Ocarina of Time does. It is reflective and lonely and hopeful and makes it clear that the player is about to start something important, something bigger than they've ever seen before. At least, that's how it felt back in 1998 when I never had seen a game as big as it before. Honestly, at that point I had barely played any other 3D title, so turning it on and being met with a cinematic shot of Link riding his horse beneath the moonlight instantly expanded my understanding of what 
what video games could do. It promised a world to explore that would have more to see than you'd ever be able to find in 2D, and a story that would be impossible to tell from a top-down perspective. For being Nintendo's first attempt at a 3D Zelda game, they managed to incorporate a ton of interesting and impressive camera work in Ocarina, and that is first seen here with the way it tracks Link as he rides and eventually moves into a sweeping shot of Hyrule. It feels both cozy and epic. Really, the way the game shows us its world is as, if not more important, than what it actually looks like. Along with having incredible visuals, the audio design is impeccable. The sound of Epona's hooves echoing across an empty Hyrule field evokes a sense of solitude that is easy to envy. The moment just sounds so peaceful and clear, it makes you want to be there. And of course, the music itself plays a massive role in making this title screen as effective as it is. It uses a wide range of instruments, with the ocarina prominently featured playing the melody. It takes the game's most important item and makes it the most important part of the title screen as well. The song is somber, sweet, and comforting. There is an air of familiarity to it, and that might mostly be because of the nostalgia I have for it now, but it was actually composed to feel familiar. In a video made by Heavy Eye that examines the way the Zelda series uses music, he points out something I never actively noticed before, but I think I had subconsciously always felt, which is that the title screen's melody uses the same notes as the flute from the original Legend of Zelda. It calls back to the start of it all, almost as if to say, look how far we've come. Now let's start a new adventure. A major theme in Ocarina of Time is that of stepping away from what's familiar, but never forgetting that it's still there. And this title menu sets the stage for it. It creates a contemplative atmosphere that is unforgettable, and just hearing the first few notes, the title theme, or seeing a shot of the moon makes anyone who's played it reminisce about the adventure as a whole. It's just a really good way to establish a setting and tone, and they do it before you even press a button. Anyway, that's all I've got. You can unsummon me now. Let us move on to... What I love about the atmosphere of Wind Waker is despite it being a, you know, post-apocalypse, as it takes place in the timeline where Ganon came back and the Hero of Time wasn't there anymore, and thus the gods had to flood Hyrule, but the world isn't your typical post-apocalypse. It's not this ruined wasteland that's atmosphere revels in the despair like a lot of post-apocalyptic media. Instead, it's a harmonious apocalyptic world. It thrives in spite of its destruction, showing us the beauty of the world and thriving nature. It's bright, it's blue, it's full of new life. I mean, Wind Waker has probably the most adventurous feel of like any Zelda game. I feel like the adventurous wanderlust feel hits harder here than even in Breath of the Wild. Nothing quite gives me that spirit of adventure than these vibrant blue seas and the cartoony wind where you can see the literal lines in the sky, the sound of the crashing waves as they hit your boat. I feel like I can smell the sea here. And outside of these endless fields of blue, what you find are these little green island settlements just scattered all across the world, most of which have a real cozy vibe. Like starting an outset island, I completely understand why Link didn't want to leave for a life of adventure just yet. I also just want to chill here for a little bit longer and drink Gma's soup. Just listening to the crashing waves and the sound of seagulls. And that is only beaten by the atmosphere of Windfall Island. I hereby decree this as the most Ghibli-ass town in all of Zelda. I love just the little pockets of greenery and moss just all over this place. It's even encroaching on the architecture as it's all over the roofs of the houses. It's lively, it's gorgeous, it is home. Come on, that wooden windmill is it's just Ghibli as fuck. If I lived in the Zelda world, I would come here every day. Every day. Wind Waker just got some of the most lighthearted, bubbly vibes of the entire Zelda series. Like Makar just playing his little tune as everyone else is just vibing to that shit. That shit makes you tear up at how wholesome that shit is.
And now it's time for guess number two. Hey, I'm Liam Triforce, thanks for having me. So I wanted to talk about two instances of atmosphere in Zelda from The Wind Waker. The first is the feeling I get when I'm sailing the Great Sea at night. There's no background music playing, and I could be going pretty much anywhere. Whether I'm looking for my next island, searching for buried treasure, or tracking down the ghost ship, this ocean is a blank slate for my next adventure. Honestly, I could just be sitting in the water and looking out at different things, and it still feels like a joy to exist in this world. The second is when you're in a cave in The Wind Waker. It plays this ambient, woodwind piece that feels foreboding, as if you're not meant to be in there. Ocarina of Time had a similar woodwind piece that felt more mysterious and fun. And I think loving ambience in caves extends to other Zelda games for sure, like Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and Twilight Princess, but The Wind Waker has added context that make these caves resonate with me most. The Great Sea exists on top of the flooded remains of the Hyrule from Ocarina of Time, giving both the islands you visit and the caves themselves this added emotional weight and mystique. You never know what each island is going to have in store for you until you approach them. You might think these examples are both fairly non-specific, but they actually tie into why I love the game to death. The game is about exploration and forging your own path, as well as letting go of the past. This new Hyrule can be beautiful, if given a chance. If you want to watch my videos, I make long retrospectives on games, and I have videos on every main series Zelda game in my back catalog. Excluding Tears of the Kingdom because it's still pretty new. Anyway, thanks again for having me. Bye bye But for returning players who have played its predecessor, you know, Ocarina of Time, I feel like you get equal parts, obviously, whimsy, but also this melancholic feeling. As what these waters that you are exploring are on top of is the washed away world of the game you first played. And nowhere does that atmosphere hit harder than when you actually go underwater and see that washed away land. The old remains of Hyrule are deep underwater, completely frozen in time. Oh man, did this shit do something to my young ass heart. It's a vibe that I can only really get here. The past world that we once knew and at one point lived in is now frozen like a statue, a vessel of the past. And going in there, Seeing the colors muted, the enemies completely static, and the music oh so faint, and the loudest noise being your footsteps. It's eerie, it's nostalgic, but it's so, so, so somber. But you can't live in that. You can't fixate on the past at what once was. Because if you do, you'll end up much like this castle, frozen in time. And that's exactly what Wind Waker tells us through its villains, or through its themes, or of course, its atmosphere. Because the most evident and powerful feeling I get from Wind Waker is that of hope. A hope for a better future. As this is a world and people that continue to live despite its destruction. It continued to live on having this adventurous, hopeful atmosphere, showing us that we have to have hope even in the darkest of times, even if the world we knew is gone. Because in front of us lies a new world, ready to be explored. And the atmosphere throughout the entire game reflects that as we ride the very winds of that hope to a better future. Or in this video's case, a far more browner future, as what we're talking about next is Now with Twilight Princess, it's a bit hard to add on anything as I kind of already said everything I needed to say in my Twilight Princess video here where I had a whole section on its atmosphere. So please forgive me if I repeat some things. 
To me, Twilight Princess is right up there with Majora's Mask as one of the most atmospheric Zeldas of all. Even down to the dialogue of the game. Like, this game opens up with the lines, Do you ever feel a strange sadness as dusk falls? Like, holy shit, from that you already know the vibes here are gonna be heavy. But what I love most about TP is I feel it has the widest range of uh, different types of vibes and atmospheres you can feel. As TP lives in the twilight of vibes. It can have the most dark, horrifying, twisted atmosphere like this deranged ass cutscene. Just as much as it can have the most serene, beautiful, radiant vibes. Oh, the sound of running water, the birds and the bugs flying around. That, you see that rainbow? Oh, that's good. That's so good. You get sorrowful graveyards where the loudest sound you hear is the blowing wind. Terrifying ancient sand prisons that upon entering you hear this. The absolute eerie, unearthly vibes of the Twilight Realm. The black geometric particles just in the air. This like washed sepia tone color across everything. Everything about this place is way more Silent Hill than it is Zelda. Just listen to this ethereal ass music. Now that is the sound of the back rooms and this is some liminal space ass shit. You get some of the most tragically emotional feeling moments like taking Midna back to Zelda in a desperate hurry as she is slowly passing. As the beautiful Midna's theme plays as rain pours down. You also get some of the most comfy, homey, down to earth vibes with settlements like Ordon Village. I hear this music and I hear Oh, there's birds and butterflies everywhere. You can constantly hear the sounds of farm animals. It's like, it's like Lon Lon Ranch, but now expanded into a whole town. And that atmosphere is divine. And don't even get me started on the fishing hole in this game. This has to be one of my favorite places in the entire Zelda series. You pair that music with the ducks swimming around, the sound of water, and the, the little cherry blossom tree petals just flowing in the air and onto that water. I want to live here for the rest of my life just fishing, and I don't even know how to fish. And I love, love, love that detail that each time you enter the fishing hole, the seasons change. So in the spring, you get the gorgeous cherry blossom trees, and in autumn, the tree leaves turn red, and then there's this red hue on like, all the environment. And oh my god, just look at these birds. Look at these dragonflies, man. This place is serene. And of course, in winter, it's all snowy. It's just, it's just a little slice of heaven vibe out here. You also get one of the most bustling and lively castle towns ever. It feels like a living, breathing place where life is constantly moving. But between all these different types of vibes, the constant that I find is this lonely sadness. Twilight Princess has a very intentionally empty feel. It's like everything is hollow. In a lot of ways, it kind of reminds me of a Team Eco game, you know, Shadow of the Colossus, for example. The dungeons all seem to be these dregs of the past that only live on as husks of said past. Though what seems to be carcass of an elder tree from maybe a past game, a laid dormant sandy prison that sounds like the prisoners are still haunting to this day. A quiet, surreal, City in the sky, where all you hear outside of the very uncanny, alien sounding music is a empty gust of wind. A once seemingly fully lived in mansion that is now empty, covered in ice and snow, and currently only inhabited by uh, two yetis that just happen to live there. And only hits harder as you see all these paintings of what seems to be a very royal type of family that maybe once lived here. I mean, Snow Peak in general has to be one of the most lonely places in all of Twilight Princess, mostly provided by the beautiful music. 
It's got this constant, mesmerizing, angelic vocal. And then you have just these little notes that come in very spaced apart from each other, adding to the emptiness, adding to the loneliness, and just making this place feel even more cold. There's a completely empty old west town full of nothing but dusty air, a single resident, and a lot of cats. <laughs> the sacred grove is this hidden, ancient, overgrown, beautiful place. And now, our final guest of the night. I have been thinking about the city in the sky since I was a young lad. Hey, by the way, I'm King K. Talk about video games, you might know me. And if you do know me, you've already heard me gas this place up multiple times. But like, there's a reason I'm so crazy about this place. I remember the section leading up to this area. It was this huge region-spanning quest to collect these sigils by moving owl statues. I was too dumb to figure it all out at my young age. So this was the first thing I had to look up online. It was a lot of work I had to put in, and eventually it ended with me being shot into the sky. My interest peaked, I rocketed into the sky, only for my ears to be graced with something otherworldly. I remember sitting here for a while, just kind of taking it all in. Where was I? What the hell is this place? It's where the bird people come from? Hang on, this weird fucker running around the dungeons has an entire race of people and they just live up here? I think all kids dream of flying up into the clouds, but actually being up there looking over the edge and seeing nothing but white, it blew my mind. The idea of a city floating in the sky was so cool. How did it get up here? Who built it? Certainly not these little dudes. The dungeons in Twilight Princess are all fantastic, but this is the one that feels the most lonely. You're thousands of feet off the ground, surrounded by nothing but the sky above and the clouds below. You're transported to another dimension entirely. It's just you and Argorok, soaring around the place, antagonizing you at every turn, waiting atop his throne, almost beckoning you to come challenge him. This was one of the first times a game just left me speechless. When someone asks me about Zelda atmosphere, this is the place I'll think about first, without fail. There's just something about it. All throughout Hyrule is just this lonely sorrow, a feeling of being forgotten. It's a very liminal space-ass vibe. Specifically, it reminds me of those liminal spaces where it's like an old, like maybe like a Toys R Us or like a an old mall, but like after they've closed down and they're empty. You feel this feeling of like, I know that place, I have been there, but this sadness because now you're seeing it empty and forgotten. But I also think it reflects on a lot of the themes of Twilight Princess. A big part of this game is this version of Link learning from the old Link. I really feel this intimate connection between uh, the hero of time Link, who in this timeline saved Hyrule but wasn't remembered and was forgotten got and the atmosphere of this version of Hyrule. That feeling of being forgotten by time is felt all over this world. But where I think you feel it the strongest is riding through Hyrule Field at night. A golden twilight fills the horizon. The night sky, it's calming, it's lonely, it's desolate, and it's melancholic. And all you hear is this serene song, which, if you listen closely, has a ghostly echo of Malin's singing. A sound of the forgotten past. You see this, you feel this, and suddenly you begin to remember those opening lines. Do you ever feel a strange sadness as dusk falls? And then come the following lines. They say it's the only time when our world intersects with theirs. The only time we can feel the lingering regrets of spirits who have left our world. That is why loneliness always pervades the hour of twilight.
that this is the atmosphere of Twilight Princess. Woo! Again, I can end the video right there, but uh, let's uh, let's cut to our uh, mid bumper, shall we? <laughs> I feel like the idea of like a Zelda movie has always been in the consciousness of Zelda fans. And usually it was always the idea that it would be an animated Ghibli film. Mm, really wish we were in that timeline. But no more did that sentiment grow than with the release of I'm gonna be talking about breath and tears in this moment because the vibes are very similar, obviously. One of the key components of a great Ghibli film is atmosphere. And Zelda has always captured that. But that is felt even more with these two games. The art style alone of these games really provides that atmosphere. <laughs> it's my favorite look for Zelda. Granted, that doesn't mean I want like every Zelda to look like this from now on, as I like how Nintendo always made Zelda's art styles kind of fit their general vibes. You know, you can't have a Wind Waker looking like TP and vice versa. But so far of the art styles we've seen, this is my favorite. It provides such a timeless beauty to all the visuals. It makes certain skyboxes have an atmosphere of their very own. Never more in a game did I just stop and take a moment to bask in the scenery of Breath of the Wild and uh, Tears of the Kingdom. I guess you could say I took a real breath. atmospheres are some of the most calming, serene, and beautiful of all. It kind of strikes a balance between Twilight Princess's lonely emptiness and Wind Waker's harmonious apocalypse. As once again, this world takes place after a great tragedy, a war. And while it is ravaged, it still holds a beauty. Nature, despite the great devastation, continues to thrive, thus providing the game with this very indifferent feeling. Regardless of what might have happened, the grass will continue to grow and dance in the wind. The sun will continue to shine on these rolling green hills. Animals continue to roam these lands. And at times buck me the fuck off a mountain. And I will continue to run across these beautiful fields of flowers. Uh, <laughs> But this also, once again, provides an atmosphere that is melancholic in tone. All across this world is a feeling of history, of time gone by. It hits the hardest when you see just these ruins of old structures, but especially of the ones that we remember from past games. You feel it almost immediately seeing the Temple of Time, a place that in past games had so much sacred importance, but here it's a footnote in the wild. It's torn apart, it's ravaged, and completely abandoned. And the only thing living there is nature itself. But I feel seeing Lon Lon Ranch even hits harder than that. It's truly a gorgeously sorrow feeling you get here. Beautifully helped by the minimal, subtle OST of these games. As in both the Temple of Time and Lon Lon Ranch, you hear a 
more scattered, spaced, empty version of the songs from those places in the past. You also get this theme for more recent locations like Fort Hateno, giving us this grim reminder of the war. As you can see, all these guardians just left here dead and covered now in moss. And Tears of the Kingdom only adds more types of atmospheres to this world. The Sky Islands are so beautiful with their nature and their color, but also have a feeling of being an ancient, forgotten relic. They are completely abandoned plots of land that are empty. A little too empty if you're asking me! And I think every Zelda fan for the rest of their life will remember the first moment going down into the depths and hearing this fucking terrifying ass sound? I was not ready! And then you find this completely pitch black, murky, hostile underground of the entire hive. It's a truly one-of-a-kind feeling, and this place really reminds me of the toxic jungle from Nausicaa. And again, you feel this feeling of a world that is completely indifferent to us as the player. The game's atmosphere is never screaming at us to go anywhere. And thus, the feeling of exploration only feels more natural. Like finding an entire beautiful seaside village made of wooden huts? Finding this place completely on my own, just exploring, was one of the best feelings in this entire game. The indifferent atmosphere really helps in making finding these little gems of beauty so much more special. Like seeing this glowing mountain far in the distance and going there and finding this, just this enchanting oasis full of these seemingly spirit creatures and this lord of the mountain. The first time I came here, I didn't even try to like approach, attack, or like ride uh, the lord of the mountain, okay? I didn't want to disturb anything, so I just sat there and let myself bask in it and just live here for as long as I could. And I feel that atmosphere of nature continuing to live and thrive in the face of ruin is reflected onto us and helps us understand the themes of this game. As life is very sparse in these games, but it is alive and it's thriving. All the beautiful towns and settlements in these games are direct examples of that. Though I'd say a personal favorite of mine is definitely Hateno Village. I obviously tend to love these classical, like fantasy, homey, farm-ish villages. And maybe it's like the structure of the houses themselves, but I remember growing up in places like Kakariko Village in Ocarina or Ordon Village in Twilight Princess. My older brother would always call these locations uh, Bosnia. It's where my family is from, and I really feel that connection here in Hateno. The world of Breath of the Wild, while in ruin, continues to try to live and rebuild. And you see that with the ending of Breath of the Wild, and Tears of the Kingdom only furthers that feeling with places like uh, the little castle town area that I can't remember the name of right now, but it's like a, it's like they're rebuilding it and really built, rebuilding all parts of Hyrule. But if there was a single game that immediately comes to mind when I say atmosphere, you, you know what we're talking about. It's Majora's Mask isn't just my favorite Zelda game, it is one of my favorite top 10 games of all time. And I just love how different it is to its predecessor. If Ocarina of Time was a blockbuster film, then Majora's Mask is a heady indie darling. And the game is just seeping with atmosphere. From the characters, to the dungeons, to the little stories, to the music. So I don't really know where to start. Actually, you know what? Because this game is a masterclass of atmosphere, we can start at the very literal booting up of the game with the title screen. All the Zelda title screens have a very unique and fitting atmosphere for their corresponding game. Ocarina's feels like a sun setting, time moving on. Wind Waker feels adventurous and hopeful and exuberant. Twilight Princess feels sorrowful but serene. And Majora's Mask, probably the best one, 
perfectly captures the vibe of its game. The first opening minutes feel nostalgic, even cheerful. It's so relaxing that it almost feels oblivious, kind of similar to how the townspeople of the first day of the game are very oblivious, most of them, to the, the fucking giant grimacing moon. But there's this slight bellowing way in the back of the song that's slowly building. And then boom, we get a hard left turn. It sounds contorted, demented, deranged. It's not just a scary or dark sound. It is completely uncanny. And that is a real big part of Majora's Mask's atmosphere. It deals in the more dark, mature, and uncanny. I mean, how could the game not be atmospheric when it's a game all about trying to save this world in the uh, span of three days before this moon, which already looks like nightmare fuel, comes down and will destroy the world? But let us, very thematically fitting Majora's Mask, not talk about the obvious you know, moon in the room until the end of the discussion <laughs> and instead focus on the other atmospheres that you get. There's a reason this is the most like theorized creepy pasta Zelda of all. The game right off the bat has you getting knocked out then falling down and having this like psychedelic drug trip scene. The next thing you know, you turn into a Deku scrub. They were already telling you this is gonna be a very different Zelda game. The feeling of uncanny is all throughout the game and can even be felt with little things like the animations on the mask salesman, as he doesn't really have animations. He's more just jittering and skipping the animations. It's such a great choice to instill this game with even more of an uncanny atmosphere. And as you travel across the many different regions of Termina, I think you find all these very different types of atmospheres. One of the most serene vibes I get is in the Hebrew region. I just love the look of a log cabin blanketed in snow, and the snowflakes are falling. It, there, there's something special about Nintendo 64, like, snow levels. It just, like, embodies the holidays for me. I, I don't know. I, it was so enchanting as I was researching this, I actually post some snow levels from N64 games on my Instagram. By the way, I have an Instagram. Follow me there. It's cool stuff. There's cool stuff on there. But my favorite region in terms of atmosphere has to be Ikana. While I would say most of Ikana has a very dreadful and feeling of despair, but there are parts that just feel like Halloween to me. There's no music here, just the sound of wind, and also the constant like chattering of the bats that are flying around these graves and this dead yellow grass. But specifically coming here at night and seeing these skeleton guys just hanging out. You got the two here just chilling by this bonfire, I don't know, talking about bones and shit. And that one that is just like using the tree branch as like monkey ball. I, I, I don't know. It, it, it adds such a life to these random enemies and it, it, it really gives me a, a really cool, good feeling. <laughs> but another big part that adds to the atmosphere of Majora's Mask is the themes of grief and death. But not in the like, Link was dead the whole time, but more of a mature, respectful, almost spiritual kind of way, helping to ease their regrets. There's this real reassuring feeling to it all, that for this character, and maybe for a lot of us and the people we love, death isn't the end all be all that our lives will be remembered and the energy and the messages and the hopes and dreams we had might carry on through the people we love. There's a real beauty and respect to Link wearing these masks and then honoring the final wishes of these characters. This particular shot of Link making this grave for Macau and then bowing to him, it's always stuck with me and this shot has, it's always really personified the vibe of Majora's Mask. I mean, the fact that you even, in his spirit, play a final song with his band, the Indiegogos. It's tragic, it's romantic, it's, it's bittersweet. And the music here really reflects on those vibes. And while there's great usage of atmosphere all across Majora's Mask, I mean, I could make a whole video about this, this inside of the moon. Again, a liminal space, extremely abnormal looking, almost too normal looking, but I can only not talk about the obvious source of Majora's Mask's main atmosphere for so long.
This moon makes this game as atmospheric as it is. As it does so much for the vibe of the world, the characters, the gameplay, everything. And for the first thing you might feel is this really weird contrasting feeling. As in the first day, you're hastily trying to figure out how to save this world and, and figure out all the problems in it. Meanwhile, a lot of the people in the town themselves are hardly even acknowledging the moon. Also, it's a constant source of dread throughout your whole gameplay as you can pretty much see it at all vantage points in the game. Just in the sky, glaring at you. And not to mention the way the music changes depending on the days. As each day goes by and the moon gets closer and closer to eventually destroying this whole town, this world. You'll notice that the BPM of the music actually rises on each day. Day one, it's going at about 110, it sounds like this. Day two, it speeds up to 125, sounding like this. And then day three, it jumps all the way to 150. 50. You can even hear some instruments being added to add to the darker tone. And this speeding up of the music in each day really heightens your sense of urgency. There's nothing more nut twisting than having a, a few more minutes left and you gotta do something very important in the world before time runs out. And oh my god, what a great design choice to add even more atmosphere that each day when like you got like a few more seconds left and it's about to change to a different day the aspect ratio of you know the game will like get closer and closer and closer as each like notch of the clock it's it's so fucking that's genius man but of course where the music hits the hardest is in the final hours the music completely changes into this theme that is just the embodiment of uh, feeling hopeless. It makes me feel like everything is slowly melting. It feels inevitable, almost like time itself. It's cruel and it's cold and it's such a perfect encapsulation of like an end of the world song. Nothing beats it. Adding on to it the sound of the clock tower bells and the constant earth shaking. And of course the thing that makes the game so great and have the most powerful atmosphere of all of this is the stories of these characters in this world. Something I always like to do when playing this game was compare what a character would say in the first day to then the second day and then till the ending. Which just makes for some of the most emotional, harrowing ass atmospheres in this whole game. I'm going to tell you some of these stories as they only add to the existential dread of this this whole, this whole thing. This guy here, you'll find him at the very beginning of the game, standing up on the carpenter's little thing they're building. And it seems he's one of the only few characters that is noticing really early on that something's up with that moon. And in other days, you'll find him at the ocean side uh, spider house. He's panicking as he knows the moon's gonna fall and he's asking for uh, this place as shelter. He's hoping it would protect him, so he offers you his life savings to buy it so he could use it for protection. What's a really cool detail is depending on which day you go here and find him, the money decreases. At the earliest point you can find him, I believe he gives you a silver rupee worth 100. After that, it goes down to purple, which is 50. And then after that, I think it goes to red, which is 20. Kind of giving the implication until you found him, he was just looking around using all his money that he had, his life savings, looking for protection. So if you wait longer, he has a less of that money. And the line he always says at the end always gets me, man. Where he says, Anyhow, the need for rupees will soon be gone. <sighs> World's ending, bro. Like, fuck money. In the final hours of the game, you'll find him in the ocean side, you know, shelter, uh, huddled in a corner, praying to the goddess of time. This postman here, his whole shtick is that he lives his life by his delivery schedule. And in the first couple days, you'll find him delivering a specific letter. And in the final hours, you'll find him in his room on his knees, just very, like, sad. <laughs> As he feels he can't flee the town for safety, like everyone else, 
because it's not in his schedule. But if you check his bed, you'll find the letter that he delivered, which is a letter that he wrote to himself, pleading him to, to just flee, even if it's not on the schedule. To myself, you have been doing a great job delivering the mail. I have a request from my hardworking self. All of the townsfolk have taken refuge. I want myself to flee too. Even if it is not written on the schedule, I want myself to flee. Please. From me. Oh my god. Oh, this game is so good. <laughs> I'll never forget the Swordmaster story. On the earlier days, you'll find him showing off his real brave shonen heart, <laughs> basically saying he will handle the moon situation. Which, I mean, if you play this at a young age, I feel like this could be a very, like, oh, that's a nice little, like, ray of hope, maybe, you know? But unfortunately, if you find his little secret spot at the final day, uh, he's also terrified, hiding in a corner, scared of his own mortality. Another super powerful little story is of the sisters here, Romani, and Kremia. If you speak to Kremia, I believe on one of the final days, she'll say something along the lines of like, oh, since we're so far away, I think maybe we'll be okay, you know? But then right after, she fully confides to you. She knows they aren't safe. She knows this will be the end for them too. And then she follows up with this line, that's how life goes. There are some things in life that you can't change, no matter how hard you try. Which is just such great characterization, like, ugh. Because if you hang out with them on other days, you'll, like, learn about them a little bit. You find out that their parents passed away, which basically just left Kremia here to be the only person to be a guardian and adult figure for her little sister. And from that, I get the feeling that Kremia is someone who had to uh, grow up quickly. We can interpret that because Kremia is someone who lost her parents along with her sister, but had to be the only person left to be her parent, to be her guardian. She's probably used to putting on a brave face because she has to be strong for her sister. She might feel like she can't let her sister see her scared because she has to be this strong, brave role model for her to ensure her that everything's going to be okay even if it isn't. But I love that as strong as she is, she still needs to break down sometimes. And you see that with how she opens up her true feelings towards Link and tells him how she's really feeling. She probably hasn't been able to do that in a while. I got a chair. I got tired of sitting down and can you see me? I'm like sweating. And then there's this other interaction you have with both the sisters during the final moments. Kremia had promised to her little sister that when she got older, she would be able to drink Chateau Romani, a drink that is said to be only for adults. But since she knows that there isn't much time left, she is gonna allow Romani to drink it tonight. Some people might put implications of like, uh, this is like a metaphor for alcohol, which I mean, it makes sense. Uh, but I think the bigger point here is that she wanted to give something to Romani that she wanted and because she felt that she never will be able to grow up because this is the end, she wants to give her that. After that, she tells her little sister to come sleep in her bed tonight. And then we are hit with this tragic wave of atmosphere with these final, beautifully written lines. After they're leaving to go to bed, you talk to them one last time. And the little sister Romani says, See you tomorrow. Excited. And then Kremia says, Good night. Dot, dot, dot. See you. Dot, dot, dot. Tomorrow? Dot, dot, dot. Okay? The heaviness of that. Like, what other game? You know? <laughs> these moments. These moments that feel so human. That is the most powerful thing about this game. In this atmosphere of impending doom, you'll find all types of different reactions to it. All feeling very human. A lot of them, either in resignation or fear, have accepted the end. But there's also the ones who are blindly refusing to believe it, most likely because it's easier to do that than to accept, well, this. Being able to play in Link's shoes through all this 
feel all this. It's what makes this game a masterclass example of atmosphere. Because while yes, these are just a bunch of numbers and beep boops in a code designed to act a certain way, the attention to detail and the commitment to that, it's what makes this place feel real. Like it's not just a game, it's this little world for these characters just chilling in your console. And it feels like they are actually sad that their world is coming to an end. But here is the thing. As impending and, and, and sad and, and dooming this atmosphere is, and these moments and characters help that, I think just as much they make you want to fight for them. Stories like The Postman, people like Kremia, because you care about them, you care about their little stories, that's what makes you want to be a hero, want to be like Link, want to control Link to save this world and not let it be wiped away. Because the game made you care about them, about their lives that are, again, just beep boops and buttons and numbers and in a code. Uh, there's this interview with Anuma that he did about Majora's Mask. At the time that Majora's Mask was in its planning stage, North Korea had launched a new kind of missile over Japan without permission. People were concerned, they were worried, they were terrified. <laughs> But also at the time, the team were attending a staff member's wedding, and someone on the team had reflected that it is a very strange feeling to think that we're at a wedding as a missile might just fall on us. This of course influenced a lot of things from Majora's Mask, but especially the Anju and Cafe questline. It's a questline of two lovers who want to get married, but unfortunately one of them was turned into a child. He wants to marry her the right way, the, the way they wanted to, and you do everything in your power to try to help him, and as the world is literally minutes away from ending, and you might think that they just won't be connected again, and this is how it all ends. But at the very end, Cafe comes to see Anju, and they decide that even if the world is literally about to end, they still want to go through with the wedding marriage ceremony in this game. Because the only thing they really wanted was at the very end to be near each other, to be next to each other, to be there for one another. They set aside their fear and show that love is the best antidote for fear. That love conquers all. This game is so good. It's so good. It's things like that and that atmosphere that propels us once again to step into the role of the hero and save these people and their stories. Because that is the power of Atmos. Thank you so much for deciding to light your bonfire here on this little corner of the internet and resting at it until the end of this video. Atmosphere is one of my favorite things about games. It makes me feel more immersed in them. It makes me feel like I'm actually in this little world. And I'm so happy y'all appreciate these videos because I, I really do love making these type of videos. Also, thank you to these dudes for coming, helping me out. Uh, please subscribe to them. If y'all didn't know, this video was actually voted on by my Patreon here. In fact, it almost lost to a video about the atmosphere in Pokemon. So that will definitely be a future vid too. And if y'all want to have perks like voting on my kind of content, or you just want to, you know, help me keep these here lights on, you could do that as little as three beans here on my Patreon. I would really appreciate that. Or if you're an absolute mad lad like these people. <laughs> These here are part of my highest tier on Patreon known as the Pit Stopper tier. Basically you get a bunch of perks, but on top of that, after three months of being on that tier, I have an artist designed for you however you want, a pixel art character that shows up here and other parts of my video. And as long as you're still a Pit Stopper, they will be there. <laughs> and hey, if you like this video, maybe give me a like and subscribe, I'd always appreciate that. But with all that being said, thank you so much for coming to this little pit stop on the corner of the internet. Peace.